Okay. Uh, let's let me get started. We have we're very fortunate to have uh, as our guest today Elizabeth Whitaker. Um, I've known Elizabeth for a long time. She's an excellent architect in the Boston area. Um, she is the founder and principal of Merge Architects, an award-winning architectural practice that innovates through the process of making. And we'll talk a lot today about the process of making. Her firm's work uncovers and capitalizes on opportunities for invention in the ordinary. And in so doing, develops new methods of production that combine both digital fabrication and the handmade. This will be of particular interest, I think, to the engineers in the audience. The work embraces the craft of making within a larger agenda to redefine urban social boundaries of the city. This process of material and urban research transcends scale, use, and context, allowing the work to address a wide range of programs, including multifamily residential, commercial, institutional, retail, furniture, and graphic design. Elizabeth work has, Elizabeth's work has been widely published, both nationally and internationally. Her practice was recently named one of the 15 young, young firms to watch by Residential Architect Magazine, and has received multiple awards, including a 2013 Best of the Year Award from Interior Design Magazine. Um, and by the way, before I continue, I'd like to ask you all to really try to be quiet during today's presentation. And I'm uh, Excuse me, the person right behind you? Could you no, I'm, I'm talking to you. What's your name? Alex. No, no, the, 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 you, the person I'm pointing to right now. Yes, your name. Am I? Am I? So I don't want you to talk anymore okay. in the class, okay? Is that clear? Yes. All right. She is currently a finalist for the National American, Insti the National American Institute of Architects Young Architects Award. Uh, she graduated from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design with distinction. She is currently an assistant professor at Harvard. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Whitaker. Yeah, thank you. I don't know who got reprimanded, but I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be speaking with uh, under, I think mainly undergrads, if not all undergrads, yep. Um, I am happy to share with you today what I do. Uh, I'm going to try to, two things, keep it under 30, maybe even 20. George, you're going to have to police me a little bit. Um, and to not be too architecty with the language. So the way that I'm framing uh, the work of my office today is... Um, I want to describe what we do uh, in, in my terms, and then I want to frame it for you in the context of how we get it done. So what I am calling design thinking, design strategy. And so strategy for today's talk is mainly um, relating to how we get and convince a client to go in the direction that we want to go in. And broadly, what that direction may be um, for my office, uh, I would say two main things that we've been interested in, regardless of the scale of the projects, um, whether they be restaurants or multifamily housing, is an idea about making. I think, it's funny, George, I can barely hear you back there. It, this, the acoustics are so weird, but I think you said something about this. So we are very invested in the craft of making, and, um, and I'll hopefully explain that a little better um, as we go through the images. Uh, and also this opportunity for what I call social choreography, which is ways that the architecture, the design, um, can actually uh, create opportunities for a different kind of social interaction, whether it be inside of a space, an interior, or on a streetscape, or both. So, um, so I will jump in. Uh, so the design strategy at Merge Architects um, what I'm showing today are, I'm gonna describe each project with like a two or three word intro, which would be kind of the conceptual hook, like a bite size concept um, pitch, if you will. And by the way, I never really talk about the work with this salesman-y tone, but I think, I, I'm hoping it'll work for today. It'll be more relevant for you. Um, so Merge Architects, so what we do, like I mentioned, is a, this is a, a series of projects, just a mashup of images. Um, we try to find invention in the ordinary, which is in my bio. Uh, 
And what I mean by that is we often are working on very tight budgets um, and we have to find invention in the ordinary to find a project. So we use very often very off the shelf um, uh, 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 accessible materials, both economically and, 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 and in terms of time. And we try to invent something new. Could be a new surface. Um, so that's one thing we do. And then we try to bring that level of um, desire and obsession, I would say, to a bigger scale when we have the opportunity to do so. So most of my work for the first few years, and we're around 11-ish in my practice, um, we're smaller projects and we've just started doing buildings, so ground up um, construction. So I'm trying to carry over some of the research from the smaller projects into the bigger work. So first and foremost, communication, uh, which sounds very cliche, a little cheesy, but how do you, because you don't have anything when you start a project, so how do you communicate ideas? And of course they're drawings and, and, and renderings, but beyond the skill level of those artifacts and documents, um, it's how do you put it together, and you have to do it pretty concisely. So I'm showing a, one way, one way that we've begun to work is through collage. Um, and it's funny, last night I gave a talk to the students at, the, at Harvard Graduate School of Design about the trajectory from being a student to having my own practice. And I, they asked me to dig up some of my student work, which was quite a while ago which was awkward, but to tie it together with where, where the work is today. And I, I actually used to work, when I was your age, in collage quite a bit in school, um, much more abstractly. But here's an image that is fairly recent in my practice that we showed to um, a potential client, Novartis. And it, was, it wasn't about a particular architecture, it was about a way of hybridizing programs. So this is representing an area for daycare down below, a cafe, office space, and some exhibition space. But more importantly, it's, a, it's an image, right? So how do you communicate with an image? So first project in, this is typically the first project I show. It's one of the earliest projects we did. Um, and there are, a lot, there are a lot of things about every one of these projects that I can't get into today um, due to time. So I'm gonna try and, and uh, consolidate it to one big idea that helped us get the client to buy into the direction that we wanted to go in, where we could find opportunities for craft and find opportunities for this um, social choreography. So this is good ergonomics equals love. So Middlesex Lounge, um, maybe some of you have been there, is on Mass Ave in Cambridge between MIT and Harvard. And it was just a restaurant. Um, but what we were excited about was how we could energize the space into kind of a, this late night vibe. They have amazing DJ, so that's, we give them part of the credit. But the, the one thing we had to work with, or we started with, was this idea about a bench, which is a very simple object. And the idea was just to make it slightly wider than a typical seat and slightly lower, so that it, and to put it on casters, so that it would initiate a kind of back-to-back -back, um, interaction amongst strangers, if you will. And, you know, great things would come of it in the wee hours. Uh, but it's just a bench. So how can something as simple as a bench actually ignite a certain kind of um, uh, social dynamic in a space? And there it is. They also are on casters, as I mentioned, so they get reconfigured by the users every night, so they get to invent their own arrangements and um, groupings, let's say. So a simple idea, a simple piece that has a very specific impact on the space and makes it quite, I think, quite different than the other restaurants in Cambridge. So the next project, high, I call it high-low, um, which I never had before until I put this together yesterday. Uh, and high-low is, I would say, a strategy we use a lot, um, which is when the economics are tight, you have to figure out where to find invention and put a little more money into a project and where to put less. So not to dumb it down, but you have to mix custom and off the shelf. So this was this is in a uh, space in Waltham, not far from here. It's an orthodontist clinic. We'd never done an orthodontist clinic, uh, but why not? And it was in this dilapidated old building. The client actually bought the building. Uh, it was in really sad shape. So there was quite a bit of work to do and quite a bit of resources to put toward just the shell before we even got to the good stuff, right? The design, the architecture, what you see when it's all done. And um, what we had to work with was a double height space, but a windowless double height space. And so 
the, the high low, the low would be um, graphics. Graphics go a long way in our office. Paint and graphics is very inexpensive and can have a very big impact, especially when you're talking about branding. So we design all the graphics. That's something we do in the office. Um, I was just joking with George. We're not graphic designers, but we somehow pretend like we are. But we only know like four fonts, so we keep using them over and over. Um, so this is one of them. And so we mix things like graphics, good graphics, and very inexpensive fixtures. These are, this is a, a sink from Ikea, um, and a series of wardrobes from Ikea. So we mix things like that, that are very obtainable, uh, understandable, with something at a higher level in terms of fabrication and cost, which in this case were a series of CNC cut, computer cut uh, wood ribs that would create a shaped, kind of softly shaped, oddly shaped um, double height wall that became, I would say, the design moment of the project that makes it significant. So these are just a few uh, uh, computer drawings um, of the actual ribs and then the fabrication of the ribs and the assembly of the ribs. Uh, just as an aside, my office, not only do we pick, let's say, design high-low to go together um, to make these projects feel, I would say, high-end at the end, um, but we often have to insert ourselves as the fabricators and installers with these um, details in the project that a typical GC can't handle. So, for example, this the, we had a GC, a contractor, build out the entire space, but they could not wrap their head around this wall. So my office, uh, the architects in my office and myself, we actually fabricated this wall on site. So the, here are a couple of images putting it up. We borrowed the, uh, the, the baker stand, which is kind of like a boom, um, from the contractor, which was nice of him. And we, somebody from my office, Jamie, so we found a way to get it done, let's say. We wrapped it with uh, polycarbonate, thin polycarbonate sheets. And voila. So I think this is probably one of the strongest images to express the high-low strategy, which is the IKEA with the, high, with the super custom ribs. There's another Ikea sink in the corner. So, and then we line the wall with the, with the back storage. So very simple, I would say very simple means and methods to create something that we, we think is um, uh, n not ordinary, let's say. So how to find a project, I always say, how to, how to find a project in something that seems like a non-project. Seems very straightforward. So how do you find invention? So the next project was um, selling the client on this idea of a conceptual and material economy, which was basically, this is a bakery cafe in Belmont, designing a space that uses only one material, which is called OSB. And OSB, some people call it flake board. It's the underlayment underneath finished floors. They use it for roof sheathing. And so we wanted to use it as a finished material. We're not the first to do this. There are several projects. Um, out there in the world that have used this over the last 20 years because it's so economical and I think it's gorgeous. But what we were trying to do, there's a stack of it, just so you recognize it, roof, sh roof sheathing. Um, what we were trying to do is to find just a subtle invention in how to use the material and how that would uh, represent a kind of uh, programming and coding, if you will, of the space. So. We clear coated it, we whitewashed it, and we put a layer of polycarbonate in front of it for three different purposes. The clear coating was for the ceiling, the canopy, and the millwork. The whitewash was for the floor. And the polycarbonate, it's, it's hard to see in the image, was for what we call the store. So those shelves represent product that the owner was selling, so it had a bit of a retail angle to it. The next project, this is a space we just finished um, last year for MIT uh, for a, a new institution called Beaverworks, which is a collaborative between Lincoln Laboratory and the MIT School of Engineering. 
and they needed a, a presence on campus. Um, well, they came to us and said they needed a presence on campus, A, but B, they needed a sexy space where students would go and be seduced to stay and possibly work there after graduation rather than going to like Google. Um, and they didn't have that. They have this enormous facility out in Lexington, Mass. It's probably 500,000 square feet, double loaded corridor, very dry, um, uh, 1950s architecture and so on. So our charge was to take a pretty banal office space, about 5,000 square feet in Tech Square, which is right next to MIT campus, and convert it into this um, exciting place that would would accommodate uh, three very different uses, and and they were it was complicated. Not only were there about 25 clients on the team, but they needed a almost top secret area for Lincoln Laboratory employees that was also open, um, visually open, but not physically open, and would become a kind of maker space. So th this is a space for for the students to um, do rapid prototyping, assemble. Um, ideas and, and, and um, artifacts that they think might have legs to then push forward to the Lincoln Laboratory folks. Um, so this was a, it had to be this sort of top secret but yet accessible visually and sometimes accessible with the past. Next to a very social space which we called the lounge which is a kind of cafe um, bar area where people could come with their laptops and hang out. And then adjacent to that is a couple of classrooms. So it needed to have this distinction and division and yet operate as one large space in the end. So transparency was our pitch. Transparency equals collaborative space. So here's a quick plan of the area on the left is the what we call the lab. That is the area where they do the rapid prototyping and assembly. The area in the middle is the lounge, which is where the door is off of the corridor. And then the space to the right are these two classrooms that can be combined. So right, I don't have a pointer, but right, maybe this works, right along that line is a glass wall. And these pivoting panels open up to include, it's actually a pretty wide space, include the classroom space with the lounge area. And so here are the components. There was an idea about continuity, which is this wrapper that wrapped around the whole space, um, regardless of the divisions. Uh, and it included storage and so on, and a, and a figure to it. These objects, which defined each zone, what we're calling the meeting pod, was a workspace in the maker space in the lab area. The seating in the middle for the lounge, and then this big bar building, which became um, you know, a divider, but also opened up to include the classroom area. Some of the tables. And here's the result. So this is, um, this is the lounge area. You can see on the left, a big glass wall that divides it from the lab space. This is a better image right here. So you can see right through, it's transparent, but there's a um, pretty high security set of doors there that divides the two spaces. This is an area in the lab space where they do some of the soldering and the uh, rapid prototyping. And then a view back from the lab space looking through the, the work pod, through a glass wall, which you really can't see, through to the lounge where those two screens are. Next project, okay, so branding, which sounds very generic and broad. Um, we use this, we say this a lot, right, when we're doing working with our retail clients, but. Branding for this particular project became extremely important because they were trying to invent a prototype, a first, a, a first one of to be a future franchise. So this is uh, what's called Mini Lux Salon. There are these day spas. I think they have six or seven of them now, maybe more. And we did the first one. We did the first four. This was in Newton Center. And we needed to find a way to come up with a branding mechanism that would be translatable and scalable throughout the country. So they wanted to do this we happened to hit the gold mine with the first space because it was 20 feet tall, super cool, lofty space. And, but they needed it to translate to strip malls in, in Arkansas. So again, we went back to this idea of sheet goods that's readily available and super cheap. In this case, it's just maple ply. And what could we do with it that would create something that's super unique for the company? Um, 
help us experiment a little bit with craft and, and fabrication, the very light digital fabrication, which I'll show you. And then be very specific to represent what they, what their message is. It's a day spa, so they do pedicures and manicures, and so it was all about the feet and the hands. So how could we incorporate that into a kind of super graphic with the sheet good? That we, of course, could scale up and scale down for different size spaces. So what we did is we CNC cut these four by eight sheets, in this case, um, into these giant pegboards and left the Im impressions of the feet and the hands to become a super graphic that would, here it is being uh, produced in the shop, that would operate by day as this kind of uh, screen, right? So it's like a, it's like a big signage, right? It's a super graphic. Um, it also allowed for pegs to go in to uh, allow for different shelves and merchandise and flexibility there. And then by night, we installed it off the wall and backlit it. So it becomes a very different atmosphere by night and it'll, it actually allowed for a second means of revenue for the client because at, in the evening they rent it out as a party venue. So that curved island becomes a kind of wet bar for private parties. So the, the strategy was branding, of course, but it allowed us to experiment with a kind of craftsmanship and, and a, a, a new way of dealing with a very familiar material, but also to allow for a second uh, means of revenue um, and a branding mechanism that was scalable. So sometimes, well, always, we're a little bit selfish um, with what we want to get out of the project. I mean, we're, de we're designers. We want what we want. And then there's the issue of making sure that we're satisfying the needs of a client and that we are convincing them that we're sat satisfying the needs of a client. This was a project that rolled off of the last. Um, clients completely unrelated. This was for a very small uh, private residential project, a loft in Chelsea. And the client, all they wanted was a second bathroom on a mezzanine level and a, book, a bookshelf. So we, my desire was to um, expand on the, the CNC cut 4x8 plywood pieces that we'd done for mini locks and see what kind of three-dimensional surface we could get out of it. So again, the charge was a book, bookshelf and an island bathroom. So going back to this idea of the pegboard, um, what would happen if we did that again, but we actually inserted, in this case, a series of wooden dowels that were different depths that would then create a kind of undulating surface that would hold and become storage and become shelving. And so we did it. We it literally took over 42,000 wooden dowels, glue stick, glue stick in each hole. It took weeks. This was a labor of love. Um, I know there are not many architects in the audience. Actually, how many are there? Okay. Oh. George, <laughs> I thought there weren't that many. Um, this is the kind of thing you, if you, if and when you decide to start your own practice, this is the sort of project, meaning the labor of love, there's no profit, why am I doing this kind of project that you'll find yourself um, facing. And I, I uh, highly recommend that you jump in. Uh, hopefully you have billable work also ongoing, but these are the kind of projects that remind you why you're doing it. Um, and allow you to experiment in ways that are less, there's less at stake and it's less risky, right? You're not putting up a building yet. So we did this. We put in 42,000 plus wooden dowels into this peg wall and created this surface uh, at times that became a shelf, at other times just a surface. Voila. And that then wrapped this um, second bathroom on the mezzanine. So we hid the bathroom inside of this box that sits up on the floor. And we literally hid it. So the, there's a door there on the right. Uh, there's a little handle that's it's like a stainless steel peg. Um, so you can, you can walk right in. There it is, you can see the little, the little handle here. Okay, so one of the biggest things we do also in terms of strategy, convincing the client what not to do. So that, that can be a good strategy in life, period. Um, but particularly with clients in the world of architecture. So what they think they want to do, you have to first convince them that it's a bad idea. And then you can pitch what you really want to do and why. 
So in this case, this was our first building. Uh, it's in Quincy, Mass. It's a multifamily housing building. This is a structure that was on the site that we took down to the foundation. And there's the site. It was in a very gritty area next to a bunch of industrial as well as single two and three family. Uh, but had a lot of potential. We like the gritty sites, actually, because we get to do more contemporary work, um, less voices. Uh, so that was the existing profile of the building I just showed you. This is what the city would allow us to do, which became our so-called zoning envelope. And of course, we're working with the developer. So he said, you gotta, you gotta build as much as we can possibly build so that we can sell as much square footage as we possibly can sell. So we're like, okay, we're, we're, we're in. Um, but what, what I didn't want to do, and what they, of course, immediately said we must do, is to stack these single floor units. And what I was worried about was um, just spatially how, potentially how uninteresting they would be, but also how that typically affords a kind of monotonous, anonymous, patterned window facade, um, which I was trying to avoid. So these are some examples, some quite be beautiful, but nonetheless, there's this anonymity that I am always struggling with and curious about when it comes to multifamily housing in, in cities, um, or anywhere for that matter. You probably, most of you probably live in an apartment. Um, it, and it, it's a shame because there's a lack of, of ownership and let's say possession. And so what I love is I'm a lover of the balcony and the front stoop. And of course, we couldn't really get a front stoop here because they're not townhouses. Um, so, but we could probably steal a balcony out of, the, out of that box somehow. So again, whoops. Um, we convinced them not to do the flats. We convinced them to do a series of these double height and single height spaces, which are just cooler in terms of volume, uh, the living room areas were double height, the bathrooms and bedrooms were single height. And they, it meant we, ha we only did six units instead of nine, so that was a tough sell. But the six units, we convinced them would be so much more remarkable than the nine that they would be able to make the same money or more. And they did. So again, the balcony. So how to pack the box, how to get away from the anonymity of this repetitive facade and to have some kind of identity per, for each unit that was recognizable on the wrap, the wrapping, the envelope of the building. So the first floor, they look like flats. Those are actually the parking spaces. The, the units start on the second floor. And so we packed together these double height, single height spaces into this box, super tight, and landed here. And so what that afforded us were these um, double height windows that we recessed, we call them the voids, but they're really just double height balconies, that in my mind became a kind of cinematic moment on the facade where they could interface with the street. So it was not just about having a cool space inside, but how this building would then enliven and socially interact with the streetscape, which was a very intimate streetscape. It's not like, it's not a, a big city street. Um, so the scale of it was very important, and that became the threshold between the interior and the street, the balcony. And they became very cinematic. And that also allowed sort of uh, compositionally for each unit to be represented as this double height space and kind of dance around the box in a very um, playful way. Uh, the antithesis of the precedence I showed about the facade, the repetitive facade. And here's where we landed with it. I have five minutes. Okay, so I will pick up the pace. Um, okay, next housing project, gonna go really fast. The, the, um, the site, the pitch was Facada's Garden, but the site is uh, on, on another gritty area, this time in East Boston, and I say it with affection when I say gritty. I love this site. It's next to the shipyard in East Boston. If you can ever get over there, do. There's a really great little cafe called K.O. Pies, owned by someone we know. Um, and it is a, a neighborhood with a lot of promise. And the parcel, that yellow, that's our parcel, of course. It's near the water, as you can see. It's right next to the shipyard, flanked by the shipyard building and the fabric of the neighborhood, which are triple-deckers. So here's a view. That was our site. So we knew that all we had was the front facade in terms of a kind of tectonic expression for the building. Everything else was pretty much hidden. 
And so, because it's so gritty, there's no green, the idea was to, I'm just gonna talk as I flip. What, these are, it's nine units, there are these long tubes. Um, how do we express them on the facade? How do we get a kind of uh, uh, interesting expression of the facade that's meaningful for that streetscape? but that would also, in this case, become a vertical garden for that pocket in the neighborhood, that corner, which they desperately need. So the facade is the garden, and it's made out of stainless steel mesh. Um, it's a quirky area, that, that crazy siren octopus thing up there is real, I didn't Photoshop that in, that's made out of steel. Um, there's, there are a bunch of artists that do these large steel sculptures that they uh, attach to various buildings throughout the shipyard. Um, each unit is, is expressed with these big arm, orange boxes and then there's the stainless steel mesh that we're growing Boston Ivy and Honeysuckle on, I believe, right now. It's, it doesn't look nearly as sexy as this image yet. The greenery, but the facade is um, up and we're thrilled about it and there it is. So we have a few little modest shrubs that are starting to grow. Um, and so the balconies have this kind of mesh netting around them. Took them a month to hand sew on this facade. So again, how do you keep a developer engaged with doing something so radical and in her mind unnecessary? Um, and it was all about hanging on to this uh, dream of the facade as a garden. It was always the first to go on the table when, when the budget was going over. And I, don't, I have no idea how we finally got it up, but it, it took a year and a half. Uh, view from the deck. Um, I'm just going to whip through a positive spin. Another strategy was uh, we were hired to do an infirmary renovation, which this sad building we were going to renovate, which we turned into an idea about a corporate retreat. This is for a YMCA summer camp um, for kids, but in the off season it's never used. So the idea of joining a separate building with the infirmary, which we called the wellness center, would give it uh, this sort of new positive program spin that they would then sell and market as um, a corporate retreat in the off season. So these are just, just some images of what, what, what they wanted us to renovate. And so luckily we turned something very depressing um, in an infirmary, which is not really the best program, a, a difficult program to work with because these are about kids that are supposed to be having fun at summer camp but are actually sick in the infirmary um, to, into this idea about this hybrid program of the wellness center and the, and the sick bay. This is a project that is uh, donor funded and dependent, and so it's been on hold for a few years. Uh, every, I'd say about every eight months I get a call that it might be back on. Um, I actually got a call about a month ago that it might be back on, but we'll, we'll see. It may never happen. But that's a view of the infirmary looking out. It's on a beautiful lake. Okay, George, I'm almost done. And then, um, uh, oh, interesting. An image disappeared. That's so weird. There used to be an image next to the Buddha yesterday in my file that is of Mount Everest. So this is a restaurant for an, a Napoli, an Indian restaurant. Um, a very sweet but not super sophisticated client who wanted us to, you know, of course, build out this restaurant, but to just put a bunch of Buddhas up and pictures of Mount Everest. So our pitch and our strategy to do what we wanted to do was um, trying to uh, frame that in the context of abstracting the Buddha and Mount Everest. So we, again, went to an off-the-shelf product. These are cotton straps. How can we make something out of that? So the idea at the end was to divide up these two small dining rooms, one on the right into a super graphic of Mount Everest and one on the left, into a constructed, abstracted landscape, so if you will, of, of Everest on the wall and on the ceiling. And so we wove, our office actually wove, hand wove ourselves this um, strap wall that becomes a kind of uh, undulating vertical surface into a canopy surface over the back bar area. And then we gave them Everest um, as a super graphic next door, the space next door. So abstraction. And then last but not least, um, promote. So this is not how do you sell it to a client necessarily, but how do you market your practice in the context of other practices? So th this, was, um, this is something that I pulled together with others in 2008 when I was on the board of the BSA 
the 2008 AIA convention was coming to town and they said, well, Beth, why don't you do something? We'll give you a little bit of money. And so what I did is I invited 10 emerging practices. We were all teaching, super busy, stressed, didn't know what we were doing, still don't. And um, we thought it'd be good to get together and talk about how we could collaborate on a project um, and just kind of hang out and commiserate and, and, and compare notes. So wh what we formed was what's called YAB, Young Architects Boston, which is now um, has moved into a, a biennial of, of an archi a young architects competition uh, that we're trying to pass the torch and allow for others to um, now submit their work. It's a competition. This was more of a, of a voluntary, let's all get together and do something. Um, but now it's a competition. We've done two. There was a big exhibition at the BSA last year for, for the group that won. And for this year, though, we, we took on this um, title party wall, and we were, here we are, like, what are we going to do? And we decided to tackle this topic of all these um, uh, uh, open parcels in the city that are parking lots that people haven't built in yet, so the infill sites, and how we could do something temporary yet meaningful that, again, a vertical garden. So this was the ambition that had this, this uh, moray pattern that we would hang, in, in this case, of sedum on the side of a building. This is a building we were gonna hang it on, and, and long story, but we didn't get that building in the end. Nonetheless, we persevered, and we grew a bunch of sedum squares, and we found a site which is much smaller, but it was across the street from an architecture gallery called Pink Kama. If you haven't been there, you should go. It's an amazing place. It was newly formed about this time, and so this was a kind of a, a really great introduction to a wide audience with the 2008 AIA convention and our debut as a collaboration um, to do something, uh, albeit small and modest, but um, most importantly then to have an exhibition of our work and a big party at the end. So I think this was a, a really great kickoff of um, a group of architecture firms, a generation of young architecture firms getting together and actually uh, creating a kind of collective that I don't think the city was very aware of before, George. You could probably talk on that. Um, and then now, uh, I would say Over Under, the firm Over Under has really spearheaded the efforts to continue this, um, pulling together of a collective of emerging firms in Boston with their Young Architects uh, competition every year with the launch from YAP. So, thank you. at Yield Round Interview Table. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. this is really great. Um, you're the third architect, I think, that we've had oh, yeah. this year. Okay. We had Nader Tarani. Oh, you had Nader? And we had uh, Joe Tanny of Resolution for Architecture. They're like mm -hmm. a leading prefab mm -hmm. operation. And what's super interesting. And you had Tim. Yes, yeah. in, in a separate year, though. Oh, not, okay. not, in this, not for this course. This is the third uh, time we've done it. Is my mic on? Is it? Can, you, can, you guys hear, can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? There we go. There, okay. there we go. Let me just <laughs> style it a little bit more. Okay. Um, the, um, and each brings a really different sensibility to how they approach what they do, I think. Mm -hmm. that'll, be, that'll be my, my, my argument here anyway. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, Joe Tanny is, uh, is very much in... The, on the um, responsive, uh, let's say, side, I think, of the end of the spectrum. And it may be, um, I'm going to assert, and you, we can, you can tell yeah, yeah. me, that you, I would what argue do you mean, that... What do you mean by responsive? Well, I mean, I think that you bring a real, and you spoke about it several times, you bring a real intention to the work that may or may not have anything explicitly to do with the client issue to be addressed, right? You have an architectural agenda, yeah. and then there is the pro then there's the issue of the orthodontic a clinic, restaurant a restaurant or, or whatever or it is. Or, See, yeah. this is really helpful because it's not hmm. exactly like um, how some other designers that we've spoken to um, uh, approach it, and I think it's really clarifying to get that right out there. You, yeah. I, 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 I jotted down a couple of notes while you were talking, mm -hmm. um, and these are great. This is great because it's not. Um, I don't think it's what the average engineer thinks. I don't think it's what the yeah. average business strategist 
Thanks. So, so here, here, but here, here's I, the By the way, full disclosure, I, I don't know that I have the best business model working right now. <laughs> Um, yeah. Well, but 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 in, in terms of design, but you design yeah. fabulous projects, and so so let's talk about. It. So, what, uh, among the things you said, which were great, look, we're designers. We want what we want, and I totally get that. In other words, there is an there is an agenda that is not only the solving of the problem. Yeah. And um, so there's a friction, I guess I'd say, between an artist's interests and the client's needs, and you get at it again when you talk about. Client, convincing a client what not to do. Yeah. And, and yeah. so let's just talk about that for a second, because I think that's, that's yep. different than the kind of design thinking outline that says, uh, that says empathize, yeah. uh, empathize yeah. first. Because it sounds like you yeah. are w empathize within reason. Yeah, so, okay, I can definitely talk about that, because it's, it's actually kind of heavy on my mind um, lately, uh, for, for reasons that I'll get into. But... Um, you know, every program is its program. It's a restaurant. It's a doctor's office. It's a multifamily housing unit, blah, blah, blah. And you, so there are problems that you have to solve that we are very interested in solving that have nothing to do with craft necessarily, right? right. So we are also, I think, very good um, with plans and very good with just spatial configuration, which has nothing to do with this, well, doesn't have to do with the obsession, the, the, the sort of aesthetic of obsessions right. that you might see up there. So we, we, we do start out very practically, and we know that we have been hired. We, we serve, right? Sure. We have been, I'm not an architect who's so in my head that I've forgotten that the client is the one who's paying for me, the client is the one who has to live with what we do. I love that problem. And so what it's more about getting them to kind of take the ride with us to to um, go above and beyond the problem solving, of course, and to do something that I feel comfortable using this word in this audience, artful mm -hmm. and meaningful um, as, a, as, an, as, a, as, a, as a built work, right? And so what, that's a meaningful, I mean, that's a very loose word, but, and, and, and what's meaningful for one is not for another, and I get that, but we are, we feel like we owe it to ourselves, we be my practice, the people that work with me, and to the client to do something as exceptional as it can be. That doesn't mean it has to be loud or expensive or impractical, but it needs to be exceptional at some level. And it, often it isn't, but we strive for that. Right. And every architect is, you know, aspires to, be, to do something that's worthwhile. And we all do it in different ways. But, but I admit that the value system for us um, is often a kind of, uh, invention in something that, uh, invention with a budget, invention with a material, invention with space, like how do we pack nine units when it really probably can only fit six and right. still make them awesome. Right. So there's that, um, and then there's the, there's the part of that conversation that deals with uh, how you represent yourself to clients. So because I'm starting to get bigger clients, Things are changing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they don't really want to hear about your obsessions right, with right. that. They may want that. They, right. they they got you in the room because they love that, right, but they right. really they really want to hear about. And I get it. They want to hear about their needs and right. how specifically you're going to meet directly right. their right. needs and right. how you're going to work through it. So it's a little bit dangerous. Um, and it's funny. I had lunch recently with a very seasoned uh, architect. I'm, whom I will not mention, but I'll tell you later, is okay. awesome and, and very helpful and gives me advice every few years. And he basically said um, uh, that the bigger clients, they already assume you, you do great work because that's why they have a short list. They don't need to hear about that. Right, 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 so it's a completely different pitch. The, the, the smaller projects, that kind of sell worked very well because they're like, I want one of those, right? right? right. You have to get beyond that. Client. And so I'm learning. I'm well, learning. your smaller clients yeah. needed um, some of the magic for a business reason, like yeah. a, a, a one-off restaurant. What's going to distinguish us? What's going to separate us? We right. serve the same basic food as the other one right. <laughs> right. That, that we're competing with. So right. what's going? Right. And you can provide that magic. You know, all of this though falls right in the middle of this issue that uh, they're just going to get their um, papers back uh, mm -hmm. today on defining the problem to be solved. 
Because in a, in a way, mm -hmm. that's exactly what's going on here. Is in other words, you're defining the problem of the condos in Quincy yep. differently than a standard uh, developer's architect team. And so you, you, you explain to your client what the upside of doing this differently might be. Yeah. Wait a minute, six units instead of nine units? Right. I don't like the sound of that at all. Yeah, nope, crazy. just a yeah. second. Yeah. Um, I, here's some evidence of, 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 of how these amenities bring a higher price per square foot. That's right. And That's right. Um, so yeah. it's defining the problem to be solved, and this is so important for these folks. You know, we talk about this when, the, when, we, when you make an assignment like this. There's, mm -hmm. I don't know, we, we had more questions about this assignment than anyone that we've had so far, and a lot of that is, like is my fault. Broad. Well, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, good. It, it, well, it is. A, it, it, it's, it's about trying to tease out for many people who maybe have never thought of themselves as designers trying to tease out the, what's going on with these five uh, parts of this so-called so design thinking mantra. Mm -hmm. Empathize, mm -hmm. define, mm -hmm. they use this terrible word, ideate. Yeah, ideate. I, I hate that word, but, yeah, yeah. but, but then <laughs> prototype and test. Yeah. Well, so mm -hmm. that cyclical, mm -hmm. iterative process that yeah. IDEO does, that Continuum does, yeah. that every good responsive designer does, I think. Yeah. And, and, uh, but I think it's so important that you've pointed out that, well, hey, just a second. Um, just like you know, the architectural historian Pevsner mm -hmm. famously described the difference. There's something fundamentally different between a cathedral mm -hmm. and a bicycle shed. Yeah. They're both buildings, yeah. but they have a different problem to be solved. There's That's a right. reason why one of them takes 100 years to build and the other one takes an afternoon. And, and not only a different problem to solve, but there's more at stake with right. regard to whether it's successful or not, whatever right. that may mean. So right. the, I think what is at stake right. is a big part of this discussion because right. you can be a lot more risky with a restaurant than you can with a high rise, right. for right. example. Right. Sure. Um, so you need to understand where you can swing out a little bit and the uh, the risk is low, right? And I think, yeah, we, yeah. So we had a lot of low risk projects that's it, that's in the it. early years. That's it. And, and now, when you get into things that are more scalable, yeah. I mean, here's something that's super interesting. Again, I think folks might not necessarily know. Let's talk about a high rise, I mean, like a big high rise office building yeah. for a second. Um, it's interesting to know that, you know, office space is sold in this country as a commodity. It's a commodity, like gasoline or potato chips, um, in the sense that it's sold by the square foot. Right. Like, that's not how you, that's not how you like, find your friends right, by, right. by the square foot. You, know, it's, right. uh, you, you, you do so yeah. in a more nuanced way. Yeah. Interior design, numbers by contrast, right, numbers on Facebook. <laughs> Interior design, by contrast, mm -hmm. I would argue, is, gener is it, mm -hmm. actually, you can charge more for interior design mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. adds brand value, yeah. not unlike the value you added to your early clients where like there's no way, like Middlesex is a, is a fabulous success because of what you did. And the DJ. And the DJ. <laughs> That's of course, see, I say that and I, I never go, I'm, I'm too old to stay up late yeah. enough for that. I go there early in the evening when there's nobody there and it seems, <laughs> anyway, this will all happen to you too. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yes. But, but mm -hmm. you know, those are very unique and hard to, um, quantify attributes, yes. whereas when you get into a scalable building and you're talking about, okay, we're going to have 200,000 square feet of office space, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, the variables are, you know, <laughs> you know what, what kind of structural system you're using, yeah. um, what kind of skin you're using, and, and it's just right. totally they're different. They're blankets. Yeah. yeah. They're, yeah, vast um, design moments, right? It's, it's hard to find the unique, but, uh, yeah, it, it's funny. I mean... It, that's all true, and it also plays into, just FYI, with regard to how you charge your fees on these projects, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's hard, it's a different kind of fee when there's um, an enormous amount of the generic, right, right? Right, right, Versus a very small amount of the exceptional, right. or the, the, the anomalous, the custom, the super, the one-off, right. right, the one-off. Um, so you, you, have to you have to learn how to read your audience. You have to learn how to read what's at stake, what's important in the project scope, so that you can 
bring everybody around to your court with regard to putting more money into that crazy wall in the Ortho Bay or a lobby or whatever, whatever might be. Oh, you guys can't hear me? Yeah, it's failing. Can you, can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah. Um, right. Well, so, well yeah. it's, it, you know, the, uh, uh, there's a, a great analogy that I think helps people to understand exactly what we're talking about, which is everybody knows fashion. Everybody knows clothes. Um, you know, there's two completely different worlds in fashion. There's haute couture, the super <laughs> mm -hmm. exceptional, one-of-a-kind, handmade dress that, you know, Beyonce <laughs> wears to the Emmys or whatever. Right. I, don't know if she, I don't know if Beyonce gets Emmys, but in any case. Um, <laughs> Grammys. Grammys. Sorry. George. Uh, come on, man. Read your <laughs> oh, us no, no, actually, Read your us She's magazine. also an actress, she's in all fairness. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and then pret-a-porter, or ready to wear. Yeah. And the whole yeah. idea of The high-low. Well, it is exactly that. It's, it's about learning how to scale, yeah. like figuring out what of the exceptional can be made mm -hmm. um, scalable. That's I mean, that's right. what's so interesting that's about interesting. somebody like Joe Tanny and, and so prefabricated fine. houses, mm -hmm. because they don't do any house that's exactly the same as that. I, I, I tried to extract yeah. that from him and say, well, that's so cool, so are you gonna yeah. ultimately like compete with like, I don't know, Walmart yeah. or, or Sears 100 years ago and, and pr have like yeah. five really cool Plan, models. Ready-made plans, yeah. No, they're pretty, they're, they're, there's seven, I think, categories or types, mm -hmm. so but then there's variants on everything. There's a formula. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, there is an economy of scale, but somehow they're allowed to incorporate an idea of the anomalous or the exceptional within that formula yeah. and economy of scale, which is just, by definition, that's brilliant. <laughs> well, well, what's brilliant about what you're doing, it seems to me, is um, linking not just, and I don't know if you're doing this as explicitly as you could, mm -hmm. but like linking branding, graphic design, mm -hmm. identity with what you do mm -hmm. puts you in a whole different business model. Mm -hmm. um, you know mm -hmm. who's great at this, mm -hmm. I think, is Gensler. Yep. Um, they're brilliant at mm -hmm. it, and they offer a whole range of services so mm -hmm. that they have clients mm -hmm. that are paying them, you know, uh, a lot of fees mm -hmm. for years when they're not building any buildings, but they're part mm -hmm. of the strategic planning. Mm -hmm. you know, Gensler's part of the sort of strategy. Yep. And so, especially with these retail things, if you ever yeah. get into a, something that's with a chain, with with with, with, with a franchise, a franchise, I've done a couple, yeah. That, that you'd be, you know, yeah. David Hassin does that too, and I think it's yeah, good. you know, it 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 does sound like money, okay, mm -hmm. admittedly, and and it, and we, I would say, I would have to. I will say something that I believe, which is whenever you're designing, especially a public space like a restaurant um, or retail clothing store, whatever it might be, uh, you're always branding. Mm -hmm. You're always dealing with branding. You're right. Sometimes it's not explicit. Right. Uh, and I think that the term branding starts to, to slip into, in, in, ironically, into the, the zone of the generic a little bit. The mm. branding, it seems very superficial. Mm. There's something mm. about that word right. for an architect that feels very awkward. Mm. Um, and because, it, in a way, it, I think it cheapens a higher conceptual mm. idea. Mm. It's like, we're branding, we're just trying to make money here, right? right? right. Which is not necessarily the case, but I think it does have a little bit of a bad rap, and it's right. a, it's a dangerous wor word with, with architects, um, and I think that's why more architects aren't going down that path because th they don't want to get in the um, the, the the machine of the, yeah. the branding machine. You know, but uh, I'm interested in it. See, this, and, and this I is where I would disagree with sometimes. those. Yeah. I would disagree with okay. those artists because I mean those those architects because you know I think there's a real difference between art and design. Yes. Like, art, artists have patrons, yep. designers have clients. Right. Um, one, is you, one is you putting forward, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one is where you are the engine for the creative act, yep. the other is you are reacting to a need of another. Now, that, those are two extremes, but yep. you live at an interesting, interesting place in between those poles, it seems to me. Yep. And I think, that's, I, I think that's reflected when you say, Something like you know about like the the, the the architecture almost wants to exist outside of the vulgar realities of, of filthy lucre and commerce <laughs> and so forth. Um, yeah. And I'm not sure that's really it's always a problem. Been, that yeah. architects do feel that way sometimes. Yeah. Well, but, and, and yeah. you know, our, our, I think our school has in many ways been 
attempted to be an antidote to that. Yeah, and that's what I love about the program at Northeastern. But I, it, in my defense, I would say, <laughs> not to sound defensive, I have been very proud that I started out building, not teaching. Right, right. Intentionally, I now teach. I've been teaching for years. Um, it seems like forever, but right. there were probably five or six years in my practice when I wasn't teaching. I was just trying to build these little projects and get a body of work going, and I was not just to do it, but because I loved gluing the pegs right. in the wall, right. Right. and I was young enough where I could kind of get away with that sort of work, and and it was fun and and gratifying. But but I, my point is, I I happen to be somebody um, who's very interested in the reality right. of the needs of a restaurant, the branding of a day spa. You know, I love those real problems that we can help them transcend the generic right, and, right. The, and the banal, you know, um, obvious first step or first choice for design by doing something that's somehow more meaningful for the client as well as us. So, uh, you know, it, you're right. I kind of talk out of both sides of my no, mouth. No, no. It's and a I, continuum you know, and you and, exist and on, on, on a place on it. I don't yeah. think that's a... I, I think actually I think it's very refreshing to hear yeah. people talk about that continuum. Yeah. In other words, I think a lot of people, um, a lot of architects, um, l like to speak about uh, well, what what our, our friend Tim Love calls um, uh, what is it uh, retroactive inevitability. The idea that <laughs> the it's idea that chance. the solution that you come up with, <laughs> mm -hmm. see, what, now that yeah, you yeah. see it and it's done, yeah, yeah. it was but inevitable. Of course, yeah. of course this yeah. was the only thing yeah. that you could. Arrive at. This yeah. is the only solution to this problem. Yeah, that, that's where um, you want to be. That's the sweet spot um, right. of, of convincing the client <laughs> right. where that's the only way, the only way, where place to go is where you want them to right, go. Yeah. Right, right. Now, yeah. however, but when we when we, we look at that through this broader lens of design thinking, which is kind of you know, and this is super interesting. I think the way you and I were educated is very different from the way they people like mm -hmm. at the Stanford D School talk about. Hmm. Um, design thinking. Hmm. It, it, it feels related, very related. Hmm. Um, but you know, when, when Heather Bosch, who hmm. is one of the leaders of the IDO office here in Cambridge, hmm. came and spoke with us, I mean, she was she talked about, you know, empathy is number one. It's like understanding the world from the point of view of these of other the people, client. whether yeah. they are the clients yeah. who use, and of course it's not just buildings, whether it's the yeah. people who use the catheter, whether it's the people who are exchanging the money at an ATM in a foreign land where the culture is different and senses of privacy are different and yeah. all of that is different. Um, you know, it's just mm -hmm. fascinating how, um, I, I'll speak for myself because we, we went to school at slightly different times, but you know, I got absolutely no training of <laughs> that kind. training? Zero. <laughs> Just it, have it wasn't about understanding other people's problems. It was yeah. about bringing a solution, like mm -hmm. an urbanistic solution right. or a historically it was, relevant solution. It was almost solution. inhumane, right? The, the, well, the human is... Yeah, it's, it's and not, I understood why. Right, yeah. Because it, it, it felt that it had gotten too mm -hmm. uh, squishy. And uh -huh. There was no... And the, 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 the aggregate result yeah. of the buildings mm -hmm. were not... Uh, we're, not gonna, we're not going to make a good city. Yep, yep. But it's so interesting. So you're dealing with right. those same kinds of issues, but with yeah. different in a different setting. It seems to me. Like, like I, I, I would love to have been at the meeting where um, the orthodontic <laughs> clinic, yeah. where you say, okay, you know what? I've got a solution to your problem, and, and he's going, <laughs> really great. Wow, that's wild. Because there's no way. Yeah. There is no way they would have thought of that on their own. There's just no, no way. No. And. It's now probably a really distinctive yeah. practice, and I mean, if you go to they're doing great, and we, we actually, I mean, just to take it back to, we we won a national AIA award for that project. Yeah. We didn't even want to do it, you know. It's right, healthcare. Right. It's like weird orthodontist office. It's been a good project for both of us right, because we right. both believed in it, and the the practicality of that wall, because we're talking about it, was to because that was a windowless space on the lower level, and right. we wanted to use it as a double height space. How do we get light in? We put a very inexpensive skylight at the top, and that polycarbonate wall, which is translucent, translucence actually grabs light and brings it down versus transparent, mm. frosted mm. versus clear, you right, guys. Right. So not to get too technical, but that allowed for that entire space to glow. So regardless of the shape right. or the sort of the, the, the formal reading of it, it was about getting light down into the lower level. Right. Super practical, super needed, right? right? right. And, and so 
it resonated with the, with the uh, client. That's the most open. Have, ha, everybody has been to a dentist's office or a you know clinic of some kind. They're Hopefully. Ju they're ju <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you're just you're just winging it. You're saying right. I'm young. Feels all right. I'm yeah. not going to buy health insurance. It's all going to be fine. Got no. Um, uh, uh, but but there are such dead spaces. Yeah. Ju I'm actually you know they're just there, there was only we could only go up right yeah well it's, but this <laughs> is this is the so-called low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. of the built environment that mm -hmm. I find so fascinating it's not, architects yeah. are not just to be doing <clears throat> churches and celebratory uh, right. you know art museums my God you know, oh gosh you know that's what we need is about 150 more art museums right uh, right because people go to them so of course much. I would love one I know we would but you know, 151 you know. would be fine. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, in this city, I don't know if this audience knows, we've just spent mm -hmm. um, around a billion dollars adding on to our That's art museums. Wow, I didn't know uh, the number. It's yeah, amazing. well, Harvard Art Museums is opening this week. Mm -hmm. It's a fabulous mm -hmm. new building by Renzo Piano, yep. which is going to be very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, or addition to a modification, mm -hmm. significant modification. Mm -hmm. The MFA, of course, mm -hmm. had a $450 million mm -hmm. uh, thing, and then the Gardner. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just those, let it, putting aside the Peabody Essex, which is going to have an even bigger one. Right. Addition to it. Be like, right. Overall, it'll be 1.6 billion in this area in 10 years. Right. It's a good market to get into. But let's yeah. say let's say we've got <clears throat> art museums kind of under control now. I'd uh -huh. say. Right. But addressing these, let's say, everyday mm -hmm. building types That's through right. the lens of a, I would say, an artist-oriented architect, mm. at least for now. Mm -hmm. Who knows? As mm -hmm. the practice evolves, I think is a really interesting uh, and culturally significant thing. It's problem solving plus. Problem solving plus. I like that. Um, Yes, and the, the, the advantage, it kind of works, it's a win-win for small practices um, like mine it was, is because we get opportunities that we wouldn't normally get um, in the early work, the early years, uh, and we give them a better space than they ever imagined. So right. there's, a lot of room, there's a lot of room for improvement in these types of everyday spaces, as right. you call them, right. like an ortho clinic, right? right. right. So there's a need. Right. It's a small project. It's manageable with a early, a small, young office, um, which is the kind of work I used to do. Uh, but uh, so again, it's a win-win. So how do you find how do you find opportunity um, with these? And I think that's a good place to start with these everyday projects versus like a competition or an installation, right, right. which is another kind of research void of client, um, not competitions, but installations. We actually treated a lot of our early projects almost like installations in a right, way. Right, right. Um, but the exciting thing is they, they, they last longer, <laughs> depending. Right. Um, well, you share that with uh, Nader Tarani. He, he, he did a you lot know of that, that kind of work. For those of you who don't know, in this building is mm -hmm. one of his very first projects. Oh, is it in this building? The Sacred Space, which is yeah. on the second floor, I think, of the L building. It's literally, it's like right up there. Has anybody ever been there? Yeah, it's pretty incredible. It's yeah. it's 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 brilliant because it is both art mm. and it's a real problem solver. Let's yeah. say you're at a diverse contemporary university with people from all over the world, all religious faiths, mm. and you have a shoebox of a windowless <laughs> room in which to put the spiritual life center. <laughs> wow, that's kind of okay. That's kind of like that's yeah. called a big diss. <laughs> right, we're gonna we're gonna put you all in this right. tiny little windowless room. Congratulations! Yes. Celebrate your faith. What? Yeah. Well, the genius of this is that it and don't that offend. It, 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 don't, offend yeah. right, right, right. don't have any kind of detail. symbolism. Is no, like no, very no literal touchy symbolism topic. because yeah. it will conflict with Somebody else's, somebody's faith. Yep. So mm -hmm. it's very abstract. It's very modern, but it is also able to be realigned mm -hmm. or reoriented for. Islamic services, mm -hmm. for Christian services, and for Jewish services, all just all just by messing with the lights mm -hmm. and the fr and moving a few chairs around. It's brilliant. It's brilliant it's as brilliant. problem solving, yeah. but it He's also brilliant. required yeah. that they. That it has these three metal Oculus mm -hmm. forms, mm -hmm. sort of like uh, camera lens forms in the ceiling, mm -hmm. and the contractor Very said, expensive. "said um, we have no idea how to build that." <laughs> or Right. We'll charge ten million dollars. Yeah, pay. one or the other. Yes, and so the they other. they actually uh, did, did exactly what you did. They oh. built them. <laughs> they just built them. Yep. For the they just became the contractor. I don't know how that you worked liability wise. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. I did not know that, but that's refreshing. Let you? me let me ask you something else about um, digital fabrication because you're you, you, you're light digital. Yeah, you're you're you're, you're wading into us. the waters of you didn't dive yeah. in mm -mm. skull first. No. Um, mm -mm. Do you do you see yourself continuing to 
use yeah. that, and what advantages does it bring yeah, to your practice? Yeah, let me talk to you about, the, especially for those of you that are um, uh, in the architecture program. So you know that it's just, you know, it's its own baby, right? And we, I, my office, we do not claim to be part of this high digital fabrication um, set, so to speak, right? right? We are not, I'm not claiming that we're, we are using it in a very light way right now, and we have been using it. I'm game to use it in any way that makes sense for the project. Right. It's not our agenda. Right, right, right. Okay, right. so we, we, but it's, it's just a, it's just the way that you fabricate um, right. in the modern age. So there are uh, forms and figures and shapes and materials that can only be um, fabricated with the use of computer-aided technology. Right, right. Uh, so we use it in that way when we need it, right? We are not um, working on form and, and, and uh, uh, conceiving a form through that particular right, fabrication right, process. Right, right, right. So to be clear, I would say right now it's more light digital yeah, fabrication. Yeah. No, no, this is a, this light is a high tech and low tech. Right. Um, but I don't know where it's going to go. I mean, right. we're, every, we're reinventing do you, for every But do project. you use it? So what we're talking about are CNC milling machines, mm -hmm. for example, and 3D printers and the yep. like. You know, everybody tells us this is a revolution and we're in it. Yep. And we've been kind of on the let's say, mm -hmm. on the sidelines, uh, more aware of it a bit longer, I think, than the yeah. general public. Yep. But, mm -hmm. but, but I take the point, the difference between using it as a mindset, like whatever I'm doing is, is digital fa digitally fabricated first, right. and then problem solving second. I, yeah. You're not doing that. Mm -mm. But are there, do you find yourself able mm -hmm. to iterate more quickly now that you mm -hmm. can 3D print or mm -hmm. laser cut or, mm -hmm. uh, or, or CNC mill mm -hmm. something Mm -hmm. Like maybe even at real scale, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you know, mm -hmm. and have it in your office. Like, let's see, what would this be like? Do you do That's that right. kind of stuff? We or do do mock-ups. We yeah. we. So the answer is yes, yeah. um, absolutely. And because I teach, uh, and my students are are using uh, these techniques all the time, I have access to the university where I teach to actually use these machines as well. So we we are iterating. We are also. Um, hand making. Um, right. We're doing mock-ups in the mock-up. If it requires um, a, a digital fabrication, then we use it. Right. Uh, we use shops, shops that do this uh, throughout the city as well. Um, the dream is to have your own in-house shop so right. that you're actually are iterating, physically right. iterating more. Right. Right. Um, and there are a few offices in Boston that have that set up, including Adair's. Oh, okay. um, so we're not there yet. Right. So, right. so it's not built into the practice in the way that we work in that sense, if that's what you're asking. Right. Well, no, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, for example, a lot of the times in architecture, and certainly when I was starting out, you know, the closest you got to an mm -hmm. iteration of, mm -hmm. where you could actually test something was a perspective drawing. Right. Or a model at a scale that mm -hmm. was dramatically not human, not, not mm -hmm. full scale. Mm -hmm. um, right. And that just meant that, you mm -hmm. know, when the building got built, there were just a lot more surprises. Right. Oh, oh, huh, that opening is much larger right. than I thought it would be, uh, that's or, right. or that sort of thing. Yeah. And it seems like this is the kind, one of the things yeah. that this digital age allows us to do is, first of all, you, have for, you know, yeah. our visualization is much, much better. You can get into a right. three-dimensional model. Even on, on the screen. On the screen, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We do a lot of that, by yeah. the way. The, the thing, the problem with... Um, Yes, the technology is super available. It is still can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So the, again, back to the budgets of a lot of the projects that we work on, there isn't that luxury to actually do a lot of mock-up, right, right, I'll be right, honest. Right, right. That's really probably more why we haven't it's done more mock-up. It's more budget issue than I it is a technology wish we issue. had many right, times. Right. Um, and then when we do the bigger work, which has um, just coincidentally been with developers who really don't want to spend an extra dime right. on anything, even if it's sometimes in the best interest of the right. project. Right. Um, it's just a mindset. It's how they deal with the bottom line sometimes. Uh, then the mock-up has been, it's been hard to get. Like right. I wanted to do a mock-up of the marginal street lofts. Um, right. And the mock-up ended up being real time on the facade right. <laughs> and then redoing things. So. You have to, the bigger projects like a mid-rise or a high-rise or an office building or a museum, which usually has an enormous budget per square foot, a mock-up, they're insistent on mock-ups. Sure, sure. Um, the Boston so, Redevelopment Authority requires them of projects of right. a certain size to be able to see what the facade's going to look like and everything. That's right. Um, that's right. But the marginal street thing, I'm so glad you got to that. It's so interesting. I, by the way, I saw that when it was a, 
a glimmer in your eye. Maybe yeah. I, think you, I saw a presentation you, a you gave ago. here yeah. a year or two ago. Maybe, yeah. And, um, but it, it reminds me there's an awful lot of weaving or sewing <laughs> in, in your work. I it's know, really, it's weird. It's, it's, now we're going to the high tech to the low tech. Yeah. And between the, yeah. the Indian, restu or the, yeah, the Indian then, restaurant yeah, thing yeah, yeah. Or, the, um, or this facade that, is, by the way, looks stunning on Marginal Street. I was, I wasn't okay. sure what it was going to look like when I saw, I mean, I, I just didn't know. It's Neither such an we. unusual <laughs> approach, right? Yeah. We, the, the yeah. body of, the, the primary thing that you see visually, initially, is the jam or the, the, right, the, right, the floating, the floating box, yeah. which is what we sewed onto. Yeah. And which is yeah. cool, but unusual. And so yeah. I didn't really know what that would be like in, right. real, in real life, but it, it looks, it looks great it's, actually. It's a play, it's, it doubles as a guardrail for the balconies right. and a place to put your drink. Yeah, yeah. By the way, yeah, yeah. I mean these are the things we say to the client, <laughs> right, 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 and it, it's the things people do. Right. What are you going to do on a deck if you don't have some place to put That's your right. drink? That's right. That's right. So we we embedded a, a lot of practical um, pragmatics into that facade, and I have to say, as it was going up, and now that it's finished, we we my office we stand back and say, I I can't believe we got to do this. I, I can't believe you did, and it looks great. But I mean, I, I I agree that that first meeting where you go, you know what, the answer to <laughs> yeah. your problem is to not build a standard facade. Yeah. Uh, I can just say, really, why not? Um, right. Because, right. and then you know you. But it was the vertical garden. Yeah, yeah. Th that, just as an aside, I know we're running out of time, but we had to go through probably five different neighborhood meetings for that project, and it looked pretty, you, I think I showed you a rendering. It yeah. looked pretty radical in the rendering, right, too. Right. So we weren't hiding it. Right, right. Um, and it was a nice rendering, so it, we got lucky. It's the neighborhood got behind it. Right. They were excited to get something so funky in their right, hood, right, right. and because it was on the edge of the shipyard, yeah, who's the, who's not the, many people have to deal with it unless they want to. Right. Uh, so it and was it's green, and it's green. <laughs> who's so the, against green? Nobody's yeah, against and green. and I can't wait till it actually is green <laughs> and it starts to grow. Right. Um, but yeah, so the the boxes were about, and it, it went back to how we sold the double height balconies on Penn in Quincy. It was about this interface with the street, right? A place where people could come outside and this threshold between the street, the shipyard, and right. the interior. It was a garden and a place to put your drink. I think, I mean, it looks like it, it, in a way, the problem to solve at that anomalous section of street, which yeah. is not like, I mean, would you do that on Marlboro Street in the Back Bay? Probably they not. They would never allow you to. Well, not only that, yeah. but you, I mean, you I, I don't to. think you'd want to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in other words, you, you, you might, yeah. what's yeah, cool about this is it's kind of a patchwork quilt of funky places yeah. that are art making, and it's another surface. Yeah, it's and the personality of the site. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, therefore, yeah. the problem to solve, in a way, it's a contextual solution. Yes. Which is not what you would God normally see. You. Yes. You know? Right. That's so. right. And the, just one interesting note on that, when you go, when you do a building and you have to go through variances, which means you ask for something that you typically aren't allowed to get as of right for code or zoning, you have to go through a zoning hearing and you have to go through the Boston Redevelopment Authority, a design review for right. these multifamily right. houses. So I had to do that for this project and I was like, I finally got it through the neighborhood. I'm like, oh, how are they ever, because they're very, they can be very um, strict, let's right. say. That's a right. good word, right? right? right. And oddly enough, um, they as soon as we went through the zoning hearing, they immediately, the, the design review, the guy that was in charge of the, of the project for design re review at the BRA, loved it, called me and said, we think this is great, the mayor is behind this, and he wants to see more work like this in Boston. <laughs> and I, I thought, okay. we gotta build it right now before they change their mind. <laughs> And, but the flip side is, I didn't show it today, thank goodness, because I showed too much, but we're doing a um, series of townhouses in Roxbury, an even longer neighborhood process, a year plus with the BRA, about items like moving the bay three inches this way, two inches down, and it's very, what we're doing in Roxbury is much straighter, it's much more, it looks nothing too shocking right. and we went we have been through so many conversations and iterations and renderings so it's you, we got lucky with that site you know this is tr this it, it's true that um the hurdles that you're talking about are totally exist but you know for those who are in other design fields you know what it's true in all of them there's a regulatory yeah. environment for almost everything Healthcare, mm -hmm. certainly um 
you know, uh, devices, product safety. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. When you talk to people who actually take things to market, and yeah. I do now talk to such people much more yeah. often than I used to. That's great. It's just, it's not the BRA, but yeah. it's a whole other it's set whole of regulatory hurdles that are really complicated. of approvals, yeah, and bureaucracy. No, I know. Kate, can we get some of the questions? So what happens here is that yeah, students uh, send questions by email or tweet. Oh, that's brilliant. And then Kate asks them for us. Okay. It's a lot on Kate. <laughs> yes. Having read that you strive to socially charge the design, that is, use space to shape human interactions, how do you predict in advance how people will interact with an environment? Is there testing involved, or is it just a matter of fully understanding the user and their needs? Yeah, Excellent interesting. Question. Yeah. So there's no testing. Um, that's such a great idea. Have some kind of mock-up focus group of right. a, an actual space. So there's guesswork. Um, if we design this bench a little bit lower and a little bit wider, then people are going to rub shoulders that don't know each other and, and fall in love. So, um, so a lot of it is, is, I mean, a lot of it is guesswork with regard to how they're going to react. But I think, you know, we're not doing crazy things. A bench, okay. I don't think it's a stretch to say that people are going to sit back to back when the bench is double wide. Right, right. Okay. I don't think it's a stretch to say that a balcony is going to interface with a streetscape more so than a, a facade without outdoor space on right, it, right, right? right? Okay, an open window versus somebody standing on a balcony is a very different social dynamic with a street. Mm -hmm. I, who would argue with that, right? Yeah, so, no, no, I agree. So I think this, the, the, the trying to control kind of the social dynamic, I don't know who I'm talking to with this right. question, but um, we, what we've done so far I don't think is, is that radical socially, it's just getting all the pieces in the right place to create something that wasn't happening there before mm -hmm. that we think is advantageous for the user and the client. This is, but this is a great question. Site. This is yeah. a great question because it gets at a, min, a very, very meaningful difference between in this sort of uh, one-off yeah. uh, haute couture versus pret-a-porter distinction yeah. because by contrast with like CVS, a company that we've been working with in CVS, CVS the yeah. drugstore yeah, chain, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, something like, I, I forget if it's 12 or 18,000 locations in the United States. Wow. So talk about testing yeah. things beforehand. If they're going to redesign some portion of one of their stores and they're going to multiply it by 12,000 or 18,000. Oh, yeah, you better get it right. <laughs> it's like, well, it's just, it's so cool because they, they I, we've, we've, got, we've yeah. been to their facility. High and, risk. Yeah, it's very, you could really screw up. Yeah, yeah. Like, 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 like yeah. let's say mm. the benches didn't work at Middlesex. Mm. Yeah. Let's just say. And they mm -hmm. work great. By the way, you should all go to Middlesex. Mm -hmm. um, Good it's, food, too. It's, it's mm -hmm. fun. It's great. It's cool. You'll notice how... It's patinaed. It, it's patinaed. It's <laughs> aged a little bit. But it's also... Ooh. You'll notice, I mean, just to your point, mm -hmm. how very small differences make, have an enormous effect. Yeah. Those benches are just a little bit lower than you're used to. Yeah. And then the tables are exactly the same height. Yeah. So that they... It all yeah. seems like a, a system. It's like a, yeah, a system, yeah. And it doesn't seem like tables versus chairs. Right. It does, right, it, right. It's all just a system, and, and, yeah. it's, and it's super cool. Uh, it's yeah. very noticeably designed, yeah. but not, uh, it doesn't seem overly fussed with. I want to I give a little bit of credit to the clients on that job, mm. um, because that's how they think. Yeah, yeah. They okay. think about every inch and not over-designing. Right. They are, w w the first few What's schemes, Matthew, Matthew Matt. and uh, Matthew Curtis and Chris Lutz, yeah. the first couple schemes we did for them were like, woohoo. Very razzle dazzle nightclub, right, and it, right. it was it was too flashy for them. Right, right. And so we started to pare it down, and then came up with um, what was magical about it, which were in these subtleties, right? Right, right. right. Um, so I just felt the need to yeah, say yeah. that they were very much a big voice um, right. that thinks the way that you just described, right, right. which is about the most minute right. distinction. No, it's, yeah. And, and it's very powerful because it's not how we're programmed to think in a way, you know, right. it's like, it's like when you see somebody, the clearest example of this mm. is in how people dress themselves. Mm. What do I mean? Mm. Um, somebody says, wow, I love that sweater. I've got to have that sweater. Get me that sweater. Mm -hmm. I love orange and blue stripes. Okay, good. Then, unfortunately, the same person mm. says, wow, those are the coolest pants. I've <laughs> never seen pink polka dotted pants before. And That's then they so put them together. And then I like that too. <laughs> and then these clown shoes. And yeah. then you know, yeah. this uh, yeah. rhinestone belt. And before yeah. you know it, yeah. um, yep. a, a, a fiasco has occurred. Yeah. So design <laughs> is the art of nuance. Yeah. 
And, um, and reduction as well as it And reduction, yeah, it really is. Uh, and it's hard to talk about that and teach it and define it and, um, but it is. And, and, and so I've given lectures where somebody says, why, why do you like square corners? Why do you use a lot of square corners? You know, mm -hmm. it's not really about that. It's about the nuancing of the box mm -hmm. or, and we don't just do square corners, right. but we do a lot of form as well, but it, it's, it's about the nuance right. and it, and it, it escapes some. And right. so if you're selling the nuance, you have to package it in a very particular way that others can understand it. You have to find a way to highlight Which it. means you have to talk about the pragmatics, the problems that it's solving, right? right, right, right? right. Um, and it takes time because in the beginning it was really hard because I didn't have a lot of work to show. Sure, sure, sure. Now it's kind of self-explanatory. This right. is the kind of, this is our hand right. or c can be if needed. Right. Um, there was a, there were many times in the Marginal Street, the East Boston facade project that we weren't doing it. I mean, you should see my just manifesto emails to the client telling her how important this was and why to right. her and her brand. Right, right, right. And I believe that, but before, of course it was the last thing to go on, so I didn't sleep for a year and a half until <laughs> that thing was on. But before it went on, it didn't look so bad. Right, 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 you were there. Oh no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, That's very funny. And they were like, wow, that looks really great. Why do we need the facade, right? right, right? right. Because it's ap it was applied. It sure, was sure. an applied garden. It wasn't integral to the right. structure right. or the wrap even. Right. In fact, it was complicated to put on. Right. So, but it was about going back and talking about the nuance and talking about tipping it from a tasteful building, which was what it was before, right. just a modernist box that was tasteful and perfectly right. fine, to something that was extraordinary, right. um, that offered this kind of landscape to the street, and something that was memorable and, bra and brand worthy, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and we've got, I've gotten a lot of calls since it went up and we haven't even published it yet from right. other developers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping it's going to work. Yeah. And, and there are people paying more for the units than the, um, than the comps in right. that right. area. So, you know, I, that, that, I, by the way, that's the metric of success for whoop, the developer. She's still, you know, they're still, they haven't sold them all yet, right. but, right. um, right. I'm hoping it'll be a, a success in the end. It will be seen as a success. Okay, let's, get, let's get one more. Yeah. When working closely with artists in Merge, do you encounter any issues or does it take longer to make these ideas and concepts realistic or are the ideas already progressed enough as an architectural concept? Yeah, I would say that um, when we come to the trades or metal artisans or artists as you say, we've gotten to a certain um, level of uh, resolution that it's about then leaning on their expertise for the nuance, <laughs> right, for the finesse, right. to make it actually work. Um, and understanding their, I, I keep using this word now, their, their uh, sort of experience with the nuance of their profession, of metal, of metal working, right, of welding, of, of whatever it may be, to incorporate into the vision that we have. So the collaboration is about that, kind of understanding our nuance with theirs, if, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it's not, we, we don't all get to the, we don't typically all sit at the table with a blank piece of paper and say, what are we going to do here, guys? Yeah. yeah. Well, very good. Okay. Thank you so much fun. for coming. Thank you.